once more these profound, powerful, potent words of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, one of the greatest promises ever. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will have enough worries of its own. There is no need to add to the troubles each day brings. There are many amazing things that Jesus spoke. When you consider what Jesus spoke throughout his lifetime, a lot of us would like to just once be able to say one thing that was half as profound as one of the little statements of our Lord. And yet he set more pens in motion and more people thinking and did more for the good of mankind with his profound teachings and his deeds of love and salvation to the whole world. Many amazing things Jesus said in the New Testament, and this is one instant. Seek first the kingdom of God, and seek first his righteousness, and everything else you need will come your way. Everything you need. What a creed. Here is a promise to hang your whole life on, let alone your whole eternity upon. A great promise. In a way, I think it's one of those promises all of us should have in some room in our house, reminding us, centering us on what really counts and what is most important. See, first, the gift of God's kingdom. Seek first the gift of His righteousness, and everything else that you need will also be added unto you. This potent, paramount, precious promise has been one that our Lutheran Women's Missionary League has propagated throughout the years. And what a time to bring it up before our eyes and ears. We live in a day and age when it is hurry, scurry, and worry. Every day we are bombarded with dismal, dire prophecies and predictions uh, conjoined with hopelessness and hapless cures by a deaf world to the teachings of the master teacher of history. There is a better way in the Lutheran Women's Missionary League has modeled it, exemplified it, and made the world a much better place because of it. And the better message that it renders is the one today. Again, seek first the gift of God's kingdom. Seek first the gift of Christ's righteousness. And everything that you need will be added unto you. What a promise. And it is true. This past September, we had 43 different families come to St. Paul's Lutheran, come to our church looking for help. They were looking for food. They were looking for lodging. They were looking for utility assistance and more. To each of them was given a sympathetic ear and time, a helping hand and tangible help. For them, the body of Christ was the last resort. For us, the body of Christ and Jesus' promises should be the first resort, our first choice, our highest priority, our utmost for our highest. We live in a day and age, though, when most people don't think about a promise like this, so it is so wonderful, and it's because we have so many temptations to addictions. There are the addictions to machines, People are slaves to digital gadgets. I mean, you pull a digital gadget away from a person and sometimes they literally freak out like they've been on heroin or cocaine. People are addicted to toys. They're addicted to television. The pursuit of those things that are lovely, lasting, and life-giving gets comparatively short shrift toward the things that really are not nearly as important. Here is the truth. Apart from the kingdom of Christ, apart from the bride of Christ, apart from the means of grace that Jesus offers to the church, 
everything else is vanity. We wonder about the world and its lack of sanity. It's because the world is ever going after things that could be labeled vanity. At the end of the day, they don't really bring the fulfillment necessary for love. One day is coming soon, very soon, when the world will be burned up. This will happen before we know it. This will occur when the coming Christ, the cosmic Lord of the universe, ends history and then melts down our planet to restore, regenerate, and to resurrect it in the new heaven and new earth for all eternity. In light of this coming, hearing, cataclysmic makeover, ought we not to lay hold of this powerful passage with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind? I think there was something very profound when Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly. I'm going to ask this question to the adults of the congregation that are over 50, okay? I'm 64, but till, why? Well, maybe you might not want to admit you're 50 and older, okay? I'd like you to raise your hand. For those of you who are 50 and older, has life moved by very quickly? If so, raise your hand. Look at that, young people. Look at that. Yeah, it goes whoosh. Caitlin and Marcus, just the other day, I was doing something that you were doing, and all of a sudden, whoosh, from 1964, now it's 2015. It just goes by so fast. Behold, I come quickly. And so we need to think about eternity, and we need to think about what really counts. And not only mission work counts, not only love above all counts, but making the good choices here in time and space. There is a towering temptation to major and minors, to follow utopian ideologues whose terrible track record is terribly flawed, and to play our boom boxes or little boxes in our ear while Rome and the world burns. Luther's advice was so good. He said we should live his soul. Christ died yesterday, rose today, and is coming tomorrow. That's the way time and space moves. I know of people who have taken this passage, seeking first the gift of God's kingdom and the gift of his righteousness, and made that their major passage in life. Whether Bob King in Jefferson City, a good friend of this congregation, or Peter Marshall, uh, the great Senate chaplain of yesteryear, they have found this passage never to be wanting. Hang on to Matthew 30, this verse, Matthew 6, 33, for time and eternity and serenity and sanity. It's an amazing promise. Seek first, said Jesus, the kingdom of God, the gift of the kingdom, and the gift of his righteousness, and everything that you truly need will be added unto you. Now, to make that kind of promise, you have to be different than any other mortal individual here on earth. And Jesus could make that promise as God and man, the Son of Man, but also because he was the one person in history who never sinned. We had a recent Bible class on 1 Peter chapter 2, and we marvel at the fact that Jesus never once did a wrong thing. That Jesus never once said a wrong word. And above all, that Jesus once, never once, had a wrong thought, sinful thought, selfish thought. He perfectly fulfilled the law of God for you and for me. And through baptism, we get His righteousness. We get His sinlessness. We get His holiness. Even though at the same time, we remain sinners. So when Jesus speaks, we listen. The Apostle Peter talked about the trials of the uh, early church. And to those facing persecution, fiery trials, and even martyrdom, the Apostle Peter wrote, It was to this that God called you, for Christ himself suffered for you and left you an example, so that you will follow in Jesus' steps. Jesus committed no sin. And no one ever heard a lie from his lips. The only person. 
And not only that, we said before, Scripture teaches Jesus was the agent of creation. He created this universe out of nothing. He holds it together. And so he is the one that can back up what he says has risen the Lord. The genius, Albert Einstein, was an admirer of the Christian composer, Johann Sebastian Bach, who sometimes we call the fifth evangelist. I remember I was in New Orleans a few years ago, and I was listening to the great shallowest, uh, you know, Yoma, 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 what's his name? Yoma, I'm not saying that. Yoma? There we go, I had one extra yo-yo in there. Okay. Yo-yo, Ma, thank you, Kathy. He <laughs> came up from Baton Rouge to help me out. But boy, was it good. It was so beautiful. And I suspect in that wonderful concert, you had people that were skeptics, agnostics, believers, and they were playing Bach, a beautiful piece of Bach. It was on death and resurrection. And this gentleman, when he played that cello, he raised all the other celloists, and he raised the whole orchestra, and you could hear death of Good Friday and resurrection of Easter Sunday, and by the time you got down listening to this, everybody was on their feet. And whether they realized it or not, they were proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Wait, wait, getting back to Albert Einstein here. Einstein said uh, he loved uh, Johann Sebastian Bach. And Einstein said that whenever you listen to him, he said, this is what I have to say about Bach's work. Listen, play, love, revere, and keep your mouth shut. Ah, Bach. Ah, Jesus. Ah, seek first the gift of God's kingdom. Ah, seek first the gift of his righteousness. Not second place. Not third place. This is something, you know, we talk about how important it is to budget when you make what God gives you to manage. Every one of us should have a budget, right? Seventh and eighth graders have a budget, even now. Share, save, and spend. Budget the money that God gives you. Work on what Einstein said, compound interest, and he said it was as great as E equals MC squared. But save, share, and spend, but also in our mind, we should budget the time. It's all right to work with the digital machines that we have and the iPads and all that, but don't do it to the point where you make Jesus seem like something peripheral. Balance your time. And amidst all this, seek first his gift of righteousness, his gift of love, and more and more blessings will continue to come to you. St. Paul talks about this in his writings all the time. St. Luke as well. A couple of Fridays ago, I was speaking to a group of prisoners that are scheduled to get out of the penitentiary, and uh, we were over at the Methodist Church in town, and uh, we were doing Bible study, and I had a Friday Bible study with that group. And these were individuals that had demonstrated good behavior, and they were getting ready to come out. And so that they would not fall back into some of the bad habits, we encouraged them to connect with the church and not be isolated. Isolation, when we get isolated, uh, things just don't go nearly as well. It's not a good sign. We encourage them to be part of the church, to be involved in receiving the gifts of God and sharing the gifts of God and keeping their eyes on Jesus and his grace and Christian fellowship. After the Bible study, I spoke briefly to the organist for the Bible study, a Baptist saint by the name of Kathy Bogart, and we were talking and we lamented the fact how so many people just don't get the wonderful, wonderful blessings from God's word, God's voice, to daily study the Bible, in corporate study of the Bible, that God would want to give to us and comfort us here in time and space and to equip us for every good work. Of the 43 families we had in September that came to the church looking for help, looking for assistance, looking for food, looking for encouragement, the 43 families that came and got a phone call this morning, a little after 4 o'clock, to help another family. So much need today, but as I listened to 
these people and give them the time of day. This is what I note a pattern, a pattern taking place where four things have these in common. Number one, all of them that came to church, none of them had a rainy day fund. None of them had an emergency fund. The Bible enjoins us on a love for Christ to have a rainy day fund, an emergency fund, because emergencies and rainy days come. And we'd like to have a rainy day around the corner if it's God's will. But it's important not only for the things that jump up and kind of bite us in life, but also that we might help somebody going through a tough time. But anyway, all of them, none of them had a rainy day fund. Two, none of them were involved or active in a Christian congregation. And they were not part of a support system, nor were they being supported by a support system. And that too is God's will for us as well. Three, they weren't going to the atheists looking for help because this is something that atheists don't do. For atheists as a whole are not very charitable. Four, in talking to them there was no sense of seeking first the kingdom of God and the gift of his righteousness and growing in the knowledge of his love that gives us the kind of wisdom to help us muddle through life better. The love of Christ wants that. So part of the goal was to point them to the Savior, the resurrection and the life, the source of love, the master teacher, and point them to his word and bride, the church. Seek first the gift of God's kingdom and the gift of his righteousness. I hope that everyone here today, whether tonight before you go to bed or some other time, would just say a, a prayer and just ask the Holy Spirit to Jesus' love to help you continue to seek first the gifts of God in Christ Jesus that he offers to you. Such an amazing, amazing promise. Watch Forrest Gump this week. Every once in a while I like to watch Forrest Gump. A lot of wisdom in there. And most of you remember Forrest Gump. He often said, and this is all I have to say about that. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Peace of God that surpasses all understanding. May guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.